and then we're going to be posting those online. Um, of course, my PowerPoint is not working. There we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, why are we here? And I just, I really believe in my heart, and I think many of us on this call really believe that uh, there are unexplored, undiscovered, and maybe unexpected ways of generating forces and energy. And I think, you know, generating forces to go to the stars is, is exciting, but I think for mankind and our life here on Earth, the generation of energy maybe is uh, even more important than the ability to generate forces. And this feeling I have, or this knowledge I have that there might be some other ways of generating energy is based on all the fundamental questions there are still in, in physics, in science, um, and all the phenomena that people experience that we uh, can't explain and sometimes don't even wanna talk about. So I think there are some new understandings of the fundamental nature of light and gravity and energy and the life force um, are really needed. And uh, Cece agrees with me. And what we like, and you know, here we are on Zoom, it's not the same as being at MIT, but you know, open discussions and heart to heart, you know, right? And the freedom to maybe even sound foolish and to speculate and be an explorer, I think that is so critical to moving us forward. So I'd like to encourage everybody. And I think we're gonna try to, if, you know, at the end, if people have questions to uh, raise your hand, use the Zoom, raise the hand, otherwise it's a little difficult. Um, but uh, we'd really like to have a dialogue and there's time in the, in the <laughs> schedule uh, after every talk to uh, have some discussions. And, you know, a couple of quotes here, I've used this one from Feynman before, you know, that he'd rather have questions that can't be answered rather than answers that can't be questioned. And then uh, this quote by Voltaire really moves me, you know, cherish those who seek the truth. That's all of us, right? But beware of those who have found it because a lot of times, you know, we think we know what's going on or we're so sure we're right or it was so hard to even learn what we know now. I mean, it's really difficult to be on top of um, you know, these complicated physics, but um, we have to be careful that we're not um, too full of ourselves, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's the right way of putting it. Or just so, too sure of ourselves. Too sure of ourselves. That's yeah. a better way Always of putting it. Always be questioning yeah. the fundamentals and see if there's anything new. We can right. Learn. So, you know, really what we want to know are what are your questions and what are your thoughts on the edge? Because it's really the questions that drive things forward. And, um, you know, so here, here's really the meeting. And I really feel that it, the time is now for us to take some action. And we really need a breakthrough. Otherwise, you know, the planet is going to go on without us. But maybe it won't be so nice for us uh, humans and animals anymore. Um, and so here, here's sort of a look at the agenda. We're going to try to explore some of these fundamental questions of light, fluctuations, uh, gravity, and the second law. There's a mixture between all the, the different thoughts on the different days, but that's kind of uh, the thing that we're thinking of. And um, this is our fourth session. I wanted to share some pictures of uh, what we've done previously. Uh, you know, at MIT, we were able to gather together, uh, have dinners. Uh, last year, we were on Zoom again. <laughs> Still, it you know seemed to work out pretty good. But uh, you know, you can see like here's Lance uh, explaining to us about uh, the Kaluza theory and. Um, and here's Sonny and Jim Jimjeski um, and Nick Cook. I think this is George talking to Kate about her uh, geometric uh, beadwork, uh, et cetera. Hal Putoff was able to join us and our dear friends, uh, Priscilla. Priscilla, who's gonna have her 90th birthday uh, this weekend. And then here's Robert Solomon, uh, Eric Davis. Anyway, so um, I thought I would give quickly just so you know who I am, and because uh, I don't know everybody, uh, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I worked at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and also at Space Systems. Uh, right now, uh, Kate and I have a nonprofit called the Unlab, where we're doing a fundamental research grants and trying to uh, encourage young researchers. 
Um, I was previously a senior technical fellow um, at the Skunk Works where I ran the Revolutionary Technology Programs organization and we did all sorts of things. There wasn't anything that we wouldn't work on if we thought we could have an impact. So, you know, ranging from engineered material to plasma, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, hot fusion approach, Tom McGuire's idea here. Um, <laughs> uh, we worked on morphing vehicles. This was a vehicle, this is a NASA test at uh, NASA Langley um, where the plane would fold up and it was uh, completely seamless. And uh, some of my inventions have transitioned from the idea and all the way to production, still in production today. So that's something that I'm pretty uh, happy about. And, uh, you know, of course, I didn't start out there. And, uh, you know, I grew up in Palm Springs, California. I used to love playing with my Hot Wheels in the backyard. Um, I was a cook for 10 years, um, worked at Lord Fletcher's where learned about management because he treated his employees really well here at this restaurant. And so therefore, I, I think that's really important is the way that you treat people. That's the kind of thing you get back. Um, I was a high school dropout. I went back to school, went to junior colleges, played tennis uh, for the tennis teams, ended up going to UC Berkeley and then joined the Skunk Works Lockheed uh, directly from UC Berkeley um, way back in 1986. And my first things I worked on were um, uh, low observables. So I'm an RCS um, a stealth engineer. And I thought it was important to share that just because, uh, so you know, my strongest uh, understanding and background is in electromagnetics and uh, the application of um, electromagnetics. And, and it's just really hey, cool. Charles? Hey, Charles. Yes, sir. This is, this is Sonny. In the interest that you, you talked about human moments, can you go back a slide? <laughs> sure. Dude, is that you on the top right swinging that tennis racket? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. I used to have hair, you know, now it's awesome, almost man. all oh gone. My gosh, I love it. That is right. awesome. Right, right. That was back in the days with uh, wood rackets and. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, wood rackets, right? Wood, wood rackets. Sorry. Yeah, this was uh, Col College of the Desert, 1981, uh, California State Champions. If you just make <laughs> okay. it a little smaller, we can still see the people. It doesn't need to fill the whole screen. It's like you can't see anybody. I'm just mentioning. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know how to do that it's without okay. sharing the PowerPoint. Uh -huh. It's okay. I'm not very good at that. We're just sort of guessing at what you're doing out there. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it's nice that there are photos of this. I, I spent so many nights, uh, sleepless nights out here at this test range, testing the radar cross section of many different uh, shapes. You know, you could put a full size airplane and things like that. So anyway, my, my major background is in electromagnetics. And so now um, at the Unlab, which again is a, a nonprofit we're trying to speak for the ideas themselves. We try to encourage the ideas to come to life, things that can have a significant impact and, and help us as humans and help the planet. And then also, you know, we try to sponsor things like this meeting and work with um, students and uh, provide fellowships for artists as well. And we've had some, a little bit of luck getting some fundamental research grants from ONR, DARPA, uh, from Sunny at the Limitless Space Institute as well. And so that's uh, some of the work that we've been doing. And, you know, I said it's really important that we try to get a breakthrough now. And, you know, I'm probably, everyone knows this, and I think uh, Jim is going to be um, talking about this a bit later during his talk. But uh, the rate of change in the climate, uh, we haven't seen this um for millennia and it's kind of alarming what the impact could potentially be here you see the co2 and, and temperature changes the last time it was changing this fast was during this thermal maximum where uh it was the largest known extinction of ocean life so if we could come up with new new technologies um we can uh um Hey, Evan, are you emitting people? 
I tried to mention before that it wasn't working for me, but I think my internet gave out at that exact moment I tried oh, to tell okay. you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So I admitted to people. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. But We're fine. Yeah. And also, you know, hey, all temperature records that were set in 2021, you could see that by 10 degrees, right, are these big dots, both hot and cold. So it's, you know, climate chaos, really. Um, technical things. And, and yet there's still 750 million people in the world without electricity. Um, you know, the population growth is, is leveling off. It's supposed to be about 11 billion in 2100. But um, so many people that do have electricity still don't have air conditioning, right? And so think of the impact on the earth as more people get electricity, more people get um, um, air conditioning, et cetera. And, where such a delicate balance is the way I view it. Um, and from Ned Khan, I got this, uh, this vision of the amount of water on the earth and the amount of air in our atmosphere is just so tiny, so tiny. And these little dots here, that's the fresh water uh, that's on the earth, not very much at all. It's a sobering graphic. It's a sobering graphic, really. and. By delicate balance, you know, it's really, we live in this state between bound and unbound systems, between uh, water in the atmosphere, water that's liquid, um, air that's out there, air that's us. A lot of it driven by the hydrogen bonds, which are, are um, so, take such little energy to break and conform in different ways. Uh, including in the DNA in our body where the hydrogen bond is key. So we are, we are really this delicate balance between bound and unbound. And it's what gives us the ability to have life and, you know, have the meeting. And this may, you know, of course, this is probably pretty obvious, but um, everything that we have, we've created from either what's here on earth or what's, or what's come to us. And I believe in this idea of unlimited abundance. There's really no limit to what we can create from what we have here. And um, that's what I'm trying to push us to do. Um, and, you know, here from tree, trees to tables to, you know, rocks to metal and spheres. But even in that metal, what we need is likely right in front of us. That's, that's one of the things you mention all the time. That what we need to do our work is almost always right in front of our own nose. Right. It's the right. answer or a resource or a way to use a resource. It's all, it's all there in that last picture. If we have the light and the rest and the, elements and the water we can do anything. it's all there yeah anything and then there's the stuff that comes to us too right not you know the charges the currents right a million amps in the um auroral currents and we've done a bad job really with our electron belt uh which we disturb not only through the the nuclear blasts that we've had out there but also for the very low frequency communication uh, really disturbs that so it really changes uh, sort of the things that we're getting on the earth versus what we used to get. And we get, you know, things like stardust, which I think Victoria may talk about uh, later. Yeah, it's amazing. A lot of the dust out there has come from space. Uh, you can find some on your roof if you know how to look the right way. And do you know there's 50 tons of meteorites that hit our atmosphere per day? And, uh, you know, <laughs> Vaporize. the vaporizes. Yeah, this one was uh, half a megaton. Uh, that was in 2013 uh, blast. And of course, all the fields, you know, the light that is coming to us and cosmic rays, which is just another name for a different frequency, <laughs> which is... Um, that goes on and, unhelpful words list. Right, right. And, you know, some of these cosmic rays are, are have way more energy than we've ever been able to uh, create with even the, the, the um, LHC uh, accelerator. So kind of amazing there. And yet, and yet... Um, <laughs> You know, there's been a decline in innovation, depending upon how you look at it. Um, well, at the same time, a huge increase in the number of papers and journals. So uh, this chart here is trying to depict the number of major events of innovation events uh, in history as a function of time. And they're getting less and less. 
And the number of patents per person is also going down. Um, and yet there's about 2.5 million papers published per year. And so it's, it's kind of interesting, this phenomenon. Maybe it's too easy to just look up the answer now, right? You don't have to invent the answer yourself anymore. You can just Google it and find it out. So I don't know, but, but um, you know, to me, this is an issue. And yet, um, I'm not sure Kate likes this chart because I've shown it so many <laughs> times, but I really believe that um, innovation follows this sort of power law that all complex systems, natural systems follow in that um, there will be many, many small innovations, just like there's many, many small earthquakes. Um, once in a while, there's a breakthrough, not so many, just like once in a while, there's a large earthquake. But the thing is, being a complex system and following this power law distribution, you cannot predict when that's going to happen. You don't know when the large earthquake is going to happen. You just know it is going to happen sometime. I grew up in L.A., so earthquakes are dear to my heart. And uh, so once in a while, a breakthrough will happen. And that's what we try to search for. And, you know, the reason I, I think it's out there and a breakthrough is... It feels imminent to me, you know, it really does. And there's, you know, everyone probably on this call knows this. There's all these fundamental physics questions, you know, dark energy, dark matter. We only know what 95% of what we see is. We don't know electron wave particle, this distribution that happens is quite the mystery. And, you know, standard model is beautiful and uh, most accurate predictions ever. But, you know, it has 19 experimentally determined parameters and, you know, not exactly um, a very simple thing. And of course, this the difference between the vacuum energy of free space based on the cosmological constant versus what QED predicts, 120 orders of magnitude difference, depending upon the cutoff you have. Um, the, um, you know, a lot of a lot of things that we don't know. And. And here's one of my, my favorites is, you know, there's stars that have disappeared, right? So this is a, uh, a project to look at past uh, observations versus current observations. There are 100 stars missing. We don't know what's going on. Is that cosmological? Or are, maybe they're Dyson spheres. Maybe some race created, you know, what Freeman Dyson came up with, where you put a thing around. The best way to harvest the energy you got is to put something all the way around your sun. <laughs> um, you know, and then even simple things, simple things like what's the neutron lifetime? Well, that depends upon how we measure it, right? If we are measuring when the proton appears in a neutron beam after, you know, for the decay, versus when it disappears from a trap, there's about a nine second difference. That's actually gone up since this chart. It's now a 10 second <laughs> difference. Um, that's kind of just, you know, some examples. And then there's all the weird stuff, right? That we don't really talk about much. Um, you know, phenomena we can't explain. And savants, it's just amazing what the human mind is actually capable of, right? Someone who can remember every word in 12,000 books, um, and this, and Stephen uh, Wilshire, he can draw an accurate landscape after flying over it, including the exact number of windows, fly over once time, and his mind can do that. You know, and then we, there's been all this news about UFOs, and you know, people experience ESP and and disturbing things with their mind. There was the Pauli effect, right? <laughs> Wolfgang Pauli, he had a huge reputation. Anytime he, they kept him away from the experiments because anytime he entered the lab, the experiment would stop working. Uh, that's the Pauli effect. So Wolfgang Pauli may not be occupied the same room as an experiment. And functioning device, he blew out lights too. Yeah, he'd blow out lights mm -hmm. as well. And then, you know, there's reports of people able to levitate, you know, St. Joseph here. Uh, the man who could fly. So pretty strange things that um, science doesn't consider. They're not repeatable, uh, not reproducible, um, you know, a lot of statistics. So, but there's always things that everyone thought were impossible. And Lord Kelvin was famous for uh, saying things are not going to be happen. 
Uh, the New York Times seemed to have something against rockets. Uh, they thought uh, Goddard did not even understand high school physics because they didn't think a rocket would work out in a vacuum. And it's not just in the past. So here's George Hellmeyer of the famous DARPA Hellmeyer questions on uh, when he invented a liquid crystal displays at RCA, uh, Dubai came to... Uh, can everyone please uh, mute uh, Jake? I'm asking you a question for all Mm -hmm. Charles, you can uh, you can, you can mute anybody. Mute. You just the, go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me. Yeah, yes. thank you. you. Should just leave that panel up, please. You know it's on your slide. There we go. Thank you. Leave that panel there. Okay. Just leave it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Helmeyer, you know, Dubai told him it couldn't be done. He was already working on it. And here's a recent one from Sean Carroll, from a professor at uh, Caltech. I'm going to read this whole one. There's something called a warp drive. There are extra dimensions. There's a Casimir effect. There's dark energy. All of these things are true, but there's zero chance that anyone within our lifetimes or the next thousand years are going to build anything that makes use of any of these ideas for defense purposes or anything like that. Man, that is really absolute. I mean, that is just nuts. That's a mode closer. Yeah, that's a mode closer. Um, he's known to be a mode closer, but uh, and but a brilliant scientist also, a very accomplished scientist. Um, let's prove him wrong. Let's prove him wrong, right? And so my hats off to the people that pursue these sort of things, and um, you know, uh, Sunny and um, Tamar. I mean, um, Scheuer and Jim Woodward and Burns with his uh, helical engine. Um, Martin has found, and at NRL, they have no results of a lot of these things. So, but they're putting information out there, publishing it, letting people take a look at it, try to repeat it. And it's like, that's what we need to be doing. And, you know, there's Mike McCulloch and his theories of um, unruh radiation and the Rindler horizon. You know, hats off to people putting the ideas out there. And there are so many ideas, I'm not covering this, but I just, you know, so here's some ideas of using magnets to generate uh, forces. Uh, uh, here's over unity ideas. So many ideas people have. Uh, here's ways of modifying gravity and getting things to float and fly. And it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, um, and, and thank goodness there are folks like uh, Mark Millis, and I, this was funded by NASA, who, went to the trouble to to catalog all these things and how they relate and and so many and doesn't that say that that uh, maybe there's um something in the common reality that's floating out there that people could almost see and people are like driven to do these things i i am just always amazed by all the people that are driven mm -hmm to do these experiments and have these ideas and, and put that out there, it tells me that there's something just right, right almost on us, but we better not get it wrong. And I got this from uh, Robert uh, Solomon, one of our meetings, he termed it a pulsar putz. <laughs> and it's like, man, if we do something wrong, are we gonna end up with a supernova? Are we gonna end up with one of these giant explosions? Is this what war looks like if you're an advanced civilization, you blow something up like this? I don't know, but we better not get it wrong. To ruin our planet, to, to save it. Yeah, ruin our planet, but you know, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of technology has been damaging in the past. So one of the things you could accomplish with your technology is to get us off of chemical rocketry. Right, I right. I mean, that'd be a right. big deal. So, okay. Um, so conservation of energy. And I just, you know, it strikes me that we always guarantee first law compliance through a bookkeeping system. And if we find a new energy source, like when we found out about the energy in an atom, we just add it into our bookkeeping and then, that, and then we track it. But we didn't know about that energy source before we knew it. And once we find out about it, well, we keep we we you know we keep track of it, and you know energy. What is energy? It's the ability to do work, 
which is the ability to move against the for a force. And a force is a broken symmetry or a boson exchange of particles. You know, this, this whole area here is really nebulous as far as what this really is. And, you know, sorry to quote Feynman again, but, um, you know, like you said, we have no knowledge of what energy is. And yet, and I think James Lee was um, uh, talking about this earlier, look at what we can do with just a little bit of food yeah. and, and how a thought, you know, uh, one thought that we have can have so much impact downstream. Um, you know, it's, uh, anyway, so again, conservation of energy, we will conserve it once we find it out. Yeah, won't be a problem. Uh -huh. And entropy, you know, the second law, disorder always increases. You know, that's based on some assumptions that it's a closed system. You have to have a closed system, an open system. Well, um, and it needs to be at equilibrium. Well, are we really at equilibrium? And how big do we define our system box? So if we're harvesting energy from vacuum fluctuations, um, here, maybe it's coming from somewhere else in the system and we haven't drawn our system box uh, big enough. And it's also, and this is something Sean Wei has taught me, is that's based really on ensemble behavior, not the detailed balance of individual entities, but thermodynamics is really based on the ensemble behavior. So maybe we could take advantage of that. And this is something I learned uh, reading Jack Wisdom's book about the Poincare recurrence theorem shows that all trajectories return arbitrarily close to where they started. Um, and that's a, a, a mathematical um, so, um, consequence. Of course, you know, it may take for almost the lifetime of greater than the lifetime of the universe. But, um, you know, I like quoting Jack here. It makes one wonder about the second law of thermodynamics, doesn't it? And so we're going to hear more about that on Saturday uh, when we talk about the second law. And... Another point I wanted to make is about gauge and reference frame, right? You know, yes, our equations have to work no matter what gauge, whatever the potential difference is, well, we can change that and, you know, everything still works. Uh, everything has to work no matter how we're, you know, what velocity we're moving at, what reference frame we're in. But the fact is we are moving and, you know, really pretty darn fast uh, compared to the, the you know, the background. And uh, here we are in the, I put a huge purple dot. These are, each one of these are galaxies and everything is streaming towards this, what we call the great attractor, which is maybe the hole in the donut of the, <laughs> of the universe, of the Taurus, right? And there's this asymmetry in the background that indicates the motion people believe, but also there is a potential difference. Um, we do, you know, right now, there's a hundred volt difference between the top of your head and the bottom. And so- And you're levitating. And you're levitating because of the electrostatic repulsion of the atoms. Coulomb field? Yeah, the, the Coulomb. Coulomb, yeah, the Coulomb field. So like the saint, he's already levitating. We just have to increase that field and we're there. Right, right. Yeah. So- you know, is there something here if we take advantage of the fact that we're moving at a certain rate in a certain direction, we are moving. And I know we can zero all that out in our work, but maybe it has an impact. Mm -hmm. We're spiraling. We're spiraling actually, right? That mm -hmm. is true. We, everything has a chirality. And as we move through space time, we make a kind of a spiraling oh, pattern. Yes. Yeah, it's our observer position. It, it might be a, important. It gives us, and we do have an observer position, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, based on our light cone. And uh, how are we feeling? You know, we only see what we see, right? And we can't see on the other side, outside of this light cone, something might be happening. But and the fish. We're always striving to see more. And certain fish, this is really interesting with this, uh, people put these bubbles inside their pond. Some fish love being in the bubbles and looking to see what's going on out there. Other fish take a look once and will never go back and some fish will never try at all. More it's fish. really interesting, I think. And so I think the people on this call- More that fish. Are that fish trying to look out yeah. there and see what the heck can we see? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, something Lance and Nathan taught me about general relativity 
you know, we fix, you know, there's six equations with 10 unknowns. We have to make a coordinate choice and fix uh, four of those. It's really the gauge of general relativity. And, you know, also general relativity is greatly unexplored. It'd be like if in electromagnetics, if the bi-anisotropic tensor, you know, the tensors of permittivity, permeability, and the, the mixtures of the two, if we didn't know how all those different things influenced what was going on, you know, um, and it's kind of like that right now, in my mind, with general relativity, we don't know how all these different things influence each other. We don't have that understanding. So, um, and the models we have give us the results we expect. That's the way they're designed. We put in the observations we have. We've made observations. We have measured things. And we make sure our models um, come out with the results that match our observations. Well, what are we missing when we do that? And here's just a list of some of the things that we put in, you know, like speed of light. Well, that's what we've measured, you know, so we put it in. And so that really eliminates the thought of tachyons, things that are faster than the speed of light. Um, causality, right? Some people think about, um, you know, the impact of going back, et cetera, et cetera. So they're really, you know, these kind of mode closing, assumptions based on our observations that uh, limits us in our thinking. And maybe it might be beneficial to explore our models if we don't, if we break some of these observations, what happens? Will that direct us to some sort of experiment we could do? If say we, um, uh, when we're analyzing vacuum fluctuation interactions, and we don't assume every fluctuation is dissipated like we do in the fluctuation dissipation theorem. What happens then? Is there some experiment we could design to go look at that then? And um, sorry about this long list of questions. <laughs> this is a tiny fraction of our list of questions. Right, but there's so many questions, right? And I, I, we touched on some of these already. What is the fundamental nature of energy? and of light for that matter, we don't really know. Um, and does energy exist independent of our physical reality? In, in other words, if we're not interacting, is there still energy there? And something that drives me, why does frequency equal energy, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's a fundamental assumption of, 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 of the quantum world and of everything. So why does frequency equal energy? What does that really mean? And isn't it amazing that, you know, light can come out of a prism and um, still be traveling at the speed of light, you know, slowed down in the material, comes out, goes at the speed of light again. That's, and we don't consider the oscillations, the frequency, the cycles per second. So the energy of the electromagnetic wave is moving, oscillating as it's moving at the velocity of speed of light. And we don't take that internal oscillation into account. Well, it's internal to the system, so we don't care. That's the way we think about it now. But that's ground covered in some way by something, and I'm curious about that. That too. is ground covered. Oscillations are ground covered. The speed of light as well. It's like a fancy trick. I would like to learn more about those oscillations. I know there's bookkeeping right, to account right. for it, but what about that? And, and you know, the source of inertia is a huge discussion and uh, debate among you know, where does the resistance to movement come from? Wave or a particle? Well, you know, does the moment, and that really comes down to, does the momentum increase or decrease in the material? The old uh, Abraham versus Mikowski argument depends upon whether you start with the wave or particle description. And, you know, one thing we think about, is there energy in human potential? In other words, in our unrealized actions and thoughts, things that um, we've thought about doing, or is there actually some energy in that that moves forward? And what can we do with vacuum fluctuations? That's been a, a, a lot to do with uh, the research that the Unlab has been doing. And you know, how does the information really, does it continue out in the universe? And of course, the question of the life force, what motivates us to try to move forward and do more and go out running or study the new paper or try to make something happen. You know, it's pretty amazing. We don't even understand the difference between alive and dead. 
So they don't understand the life force at the most basic level. No, no, right. They don't know what happens, really. Right. And How it happens. I have some nice quotes here you can read. <laughs> uh, and so <laughs> are you laughing at me no, no. no. so the uh, <laughs> you know i think of complexity right and of degrees of freedom in other words how many different things can a certain thing do to me acts like a force or is a force because if you have more degrees of freedom if you can do more things you can make more things happen. Mm -hmm. And that is like a force. And also, you know, you can think of that as awareness or, you know, consciousness as well. And here's just a little chart of some things. So, you know, for example, is, is a metal where the electron is free and has more degrees of freedom. Um, it can do more than a rock. And, you know, in our society, all of us as a whole, we can certainly do more than we can do individually. Um, and talking about complexity, I just thought I would mention our, our brains. And, you know, we think of our brain brain um, a lot, but, you know, there's also our gut brain. Do you know that there's, there's um, two thirds the size of a cat brain in our, uh, in our intestines? in our gut, in our stomach area. Two thirds of a cat, oh, you mean in neurons. In neurons, yeah, no. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? Um, right, and it produces 90% of the serotonin and 50% of the dopamine in our body. So when we have a gut feeling, or we have butterflies in our stomach, there are reasons why we say those things is because we have a little brain down there. And it's important to listen to that brain as just as well as it's important to listen to our heart brain. Mm -hmm. The no. heart neuron sends more signals to the brain than vice versa. So people have found when your um, your uh, the oscillations in the heart rate beat is consistent, you're in a sort of a, a good state. And if it, that's chaotic, you're not in a good state. So the heart brain, those are our three major brains. But there's, of course, these other things that also influence, you know, there's 10 times the number of uh, bacteria cells versus human cells in us. They don't weigh as much as us, but there's 10 times the number of them. And they, for example, if you're craving sugar, it's not you, it's the, um, it's the bacteria in your gut is sending a signal to your brain via chemicals that it wants sugar. And your intestines and not just the stomach. People think about the gut and they talk about the gut brain and sometimes they think it's the stomach, but it's the uh, intestines, the whole system. Right. Yeah. Right. Do a big job with the immune system as well as this sort of neural communication. It's important to know. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, one thing that we think about a lot is how the words really drive what we can think about. And so in my, I always say words are reductionist. In other words, you have a thought in your head and then you use a word to express that thought. It can never really accurately reflect that thought in your head. And so, you know, the words influence and govern our physical conception of what can be accomplished. And here's some words that may be holding us back. All the different names for the quantum vacuum. I tell you, you depending upon what field you're in, if you're working chemistry, you call it zero point energy. If you're if you're more of a physics bent, it's a quantum vacuum. If you're an EM, you call it the continuum. You know we met. <laughs> so there's many different names. You know virtual particles. Well, those things actually do exist for a certain amount of time. The paranormal. Well, those are things people experience. And light temperature is probably one of the worst ones, right? And it's terrible. Yeah, and it's. T completely opposite as the way artists or designers talk humans. about it. Humans talk about it, yeah. right? It is opposite of the way physics talks about it. And uh, speed of light, well, it's really the speed of electromagnetics, et cetera, et cetera. And here's a couple of things I ran across that is interesting relative to words, is that specialized terminology reduces the number of citations of scientific papers. So the more specialized your terminology is, the less citations you are. Yet, on the other hand, 
<laughs> Grant abstracts that are longer than average, <laughs> contain fewer than common words, and are written with more <laughs> verbal certainty, receive more money from the NSF. But you'll get less <laughs> cited less times. So anyway, the influence of words is very important. People so, are hesitant to cite what they don't understand, and we may have more in common than we know. That's one of the things we're going to continue talking about is how we can use words that include all these brilliant, curious people in other fields. Right. So one of the reasons, like, I don't even want anything in a slide. I can't really explain right. anybody else's work, and the more technical it gets, right, the more right, we right, lead each right, other out. Right. Yeah. So as usual, I've been talking, I think, uh, You're perfect. about my time, but we wanted some discussion time as well. Um, so just wanted to cover quickly some of the current unlab focus areas, and then I'm done. So I'm going to go fairly quick, and I'm going to talk about this in detail on Thursday, I think. So one thing we've been looking at, both under DARPA and a Limitless Space Institute, are the generation of forces and energy from the vacuum. Under DARPA, we have predicted the conversion of fluctuation differences, non-equilibrium situations, to a motive force. And we'd like to go off and build an experiment that shows that we can make something rotate really fast just from a fluctuation difference. And under the Limitless Space Institute grant, um, uh, oh, okay. So there, uh, we've shown that with a resonant tunneling diode, we can generate forces that would have infinite ISP. And we've designed a cantilever experiment that we'd like to go off and do. So in other words, you know, using a asymmetric potential in a diode, we can generate a force. And that would be really a breakthrough. That's quite exciting. And then working with uh, Nathan uh, Innan and Lance uh, Williams have this idea of EM to gravity transduction uh, via induction, uh, potentially to generate forces and also for long range communication that could potentially communicate through the earth or underwater. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, such an, in, well, you know, I've mentioned this, this information overload, right? Here's a picture of my old office, you know, so much information. Uh, Thomas Young, the last man who knew everything. Um, you know, this guy has a lot of uh, overload as well. But so our solution to that is the, um, is the, uh, this idea and David Lewis really coined this name of a QI, questioning AI, or the data program, where you would have um, an AI assistant would, for example, be listening to this meeting and would be providing us correlations that we don't necessarily, um, would necessarily see ourselves. And this would really help us and speed the development. I don't know if you have anything you'd want to say to that. Well, I, I guess I would just say rather than an assistant, I would say our goal is an AI team member. Yes. And um, rather than thinking of AI just as a tool, but really to explore the ways that we can collaborate with what we call AI. And uh, when we were describing our hopes and dreams for this to David Lewis, that's when he said, oh, you should call it QI for questioning intelligence, because the one thing that we really wanted to build in is curiosity. And this is just this whole idea of data, which also is what David Lewis wants to name his DARPA program after Commander Data, the idea that we could actually build an intelligence that we could collaborate with. So I just like to make that point. We're not yeah. trying to, I'm not trying to build an assistant. I'm trying to actually make a kind of a mirror for my own curiosity that would have the abilities that I don't primarily. My brain is full of my impressions of my experiences, things I outright made up and filled in, my hopes and dreams and my fears and like some databases of information. And it's all so subjective. Right, right. But the way that uh, computer intelligence stores information is, is not so subjective. And that's the kind of intelligence that could hold a database and also then learn to make sense of it, perhaps in the way that I do. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Yeah. And um, something on the more practical level we've been working on is what we're calling flow fertilizer. This is the on-farm production of fertilizer 
uh, just from renewable energy, uh, air and water using a plasma system. And so it would be operated independently on individual farms, environmentally friendly. It's projected that a billion people would have better access to food if such a source of fertilizer was available. <sighs> and, um, you know, and it eliminates all the issues uh, with the current system, which is the hybrid Bosch process, which by the way, provides 1.5% of the world's CO2 emission and uses 2% of the world's energy supply. And one of these things costs about a billion dollars to build. And so it's unaffordable, unavailable for many uh, small farmers. Island nations don't have self-sufficiency. Farmers don't have independence. Um, so this is something that we're actually actively pursuing funding for to develop uh, you know, it's been demonstrated in the lab. I'm working with uh, Ned Khan, who's a brilliant, beautiful artist, makes these wonderful, not only wind and water exhibits, but he's a fabricator. And then with um, uh, Sergey, who used to work with at Lockheed, he's now a professor. Uh, and so done some work to prove that this works. And so we're looking for uh, to build a minimum viable product and do some more demonstrations on farms with that. And then another thing that we're very active in is with the Contemporary Geometric Beadwork Project under Kate's leadership uh, is Fellowships and Scholarships Fund, trying to put the A back in STEM so that it's STEAM, right? And they're working on a textbook right now, but um, the first fellowships are uh, someone who just recently uh, graduated, Catherine, and uh, then a professor here at SCAD University, um, uh, Sam. So I don't know if you want to say. Yeah, anything. I'll I'll speak of it. In okay. The next All right. Segment. And then we try to do reach out to um, you know STEM. Uh, this is an example of an unsuccessful Navy pursuit that we pursued with Savannah State University, which is the local HBCU. Um, and I think this is my last chart. And so again, I just want to think about the energy of a thought and the power of questions, right? So one thought can have such long downstream impact. And how do you, how do you think about conservation of energy in that? Like Faraday thinking about um, making something rotate, right? That has led to our electrical motors and, and all other things, or, uh, Menlodev um, dreaming of the periodic table and how that's impacted us. And so when our brain uses, you know, about, uh, you know, runs on 12 watts, hardly any calories. And uh, how many thoughts do we have per minute? And I think that changes on, you know, some people have a really uh, fast interval rate, many, many thoughts, other people, not so many. And some people have multiprocessors going on. But the thing is, is that a human thought can have such giant impact. And I think that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, let me see. And that's, that's, I guess that's what I have to say. And so for the discussion, um, I think there's some things in the discussion, um, you know, if you want to raise your hand, if you have some questions or can make this big again. Yeah, let me make this big again. Uh, let me stop look. the share. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at this. Uh. Hi, Sam. And you can look in the chat too, to see what people have been saying. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's great to see those of you who checked in while Charles was speaking. I see David Lewis and Sam September. Welcome. Yes. Everyone I'm not seeing. Yes. So, um, yeah, if anyone has any uh, uh, questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand or jump in or. Um, yeah, George here. Um, hey, George. Yeah, Charles, you can hear me, I guess. Um, yes. In one of your earlier slides, uh, you were looking at uh, unusual and uh, strange uh, you might say uh, propulsion or related systems. And uh, at some point I should uh, add, I could add to your slide by uh, uh, a uh, uh, just a, a reference to the Hutchison effect uh, where uh, <laughs> there's some rather odd things happening uh, of which I am uh, rather intimately familiar. Yes, yes. 
I, I had that on my slide, and actually I had two slides on that subject, and I <laughs> combined them to one. I took off the Hutchinson effect, okay. uh, unfortunately. But I love the Hutchinson effect, and that seems like I mean that really happened. Yeah, and so uh, it, yeah. it's like <sighs> I was I was there. <laughs> um, the other thing was uh, on your fundamental question slide. Uh, one of the places uh, that uh, I find quite interesting, uh, I published. Uh, um, I published a journal that uh, asks these questions um, unabashedly is, the, is a journal called uh, Physics Essays, uh, which if you're not uh, um, familiar with Physics Essays is a pretty good place. Uh, it's peer reviewed um, and, and it, asks, it, it asks the fundamental questions as well. So I right, yeah. stop there. Thank you. So let's see if we have any questions in the in the chat. <clears throat> um, <laughs> something about the uh, you know see I I don't know about this anti gravity propulsion uh, systems. Um, yeah, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about what people are working on in secret. Yeah, who knows what people are working yeah. on? Yeah, that's not secret. the kind of thing we actually do know. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. But more than anything, uh, the, the question was about, you know, suppressed technology, big oil, all of this. You know, we know that these things do exist. Capitalism tends to drive this and secrecy as well. And so one of the things that we do long for is for fundamental research to be open source for the people, and by the people. And that's actually what we intend to segue into is the idea that maybe we can actually band together as people who care about the ideas and want to forward the work and feel the national service team of seasoned professionals who probably, if we treated it like a moonshot or the Manhattan Project and got together and had reliable funding and intellectual freedom, I suspect we might be able to make some headway. The world is a very difficult place right now, and it's not helpful to have other people working in secret. And so we can't change that, but what we can do is we can try to organize our own society and our own information and our own collaboration so that we can help each other make breakthroughs. Because you know how it is, at least we know how it is. We have a meeting, we have a discovery session, we get together in person, and that is the thing that changes us, it changes our work, it brings new questions, it forces us sometimes to reframe our questions in a way that our colleagues can understand. Because as Charles points out, if you're using different terminology in each field, it's very difficult to communicate. And to that point, one of the things to be raised in this time block is the confusion over things, simple things like measurements Kelvin, the temperature of light. Um, it's not helpful if you want my collaboration and I deeply want to collaborate if both my little tiny work light that helps me do beating and the temperature of the sun, they're measured the same, 5,700 Kelvin. I mean, come on. Uh, my little work light and the temperature of the sun are both 5,700 and whatever Kelvin. This is not helpful. Obviously the sun is a flaming ball of plasma and my work light is some paltry excuse of what's supposed to be full spectrum light. So. Uh, I'm not saying that this can't be carefully explained why, why all these measurements are correct. I'm just saying it's not helpful. Um, artists have an intimate connection with light and we continue to think of light as a fundamental, not as a collaboration of fragments. And yet, you know, people point at Newton's discovery with the prism again and again to make the point somehow that light is comprised of or light is made up of or light is uh, just a bunch of different frequencies gathered together. When I, and I think people in fields like mine simply would state it a little bit differently and it's just semantics. I would say that light can express at any frequency. And I will continue to think of light as a fundamental whole. I don't think this goes against Newton's experiments or anything else. It's just a different way of thinking and speaking about light. But if it does turn out to be a fundamental whole, 
Would that affect anybody's thinking in any way? Would it change anything you know about EM signal? Or is it just semantics and possibly helpful semantics to stop, I would say, de-emphasizing the importance of light as a fundamental? So that's one of the tiny examples of things that, uh, ways that we speak are not helpful to communicate cross-field. And we're very interested in other examples yeah. as well. I think Ed had his hand up, I think. Ed, are you still oh, there? There's a little hand. Ooh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, um, I just crawled out of the tub, so that's why my my camera's off. Um, no, I love this conversation. Uh, you started a half hour earlier than I usually set my alarm on the Pacific Coast here. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, hey, um, you know, I've uh, I studied quantum physics and um, uh, years ago, and have been uh, self studying in quantum information science, and um, uh, some of the stuff that's, uh, that I'm seeing is just uh, really blowing my mind. Um, you know, we have, um, well, you know, quantum computing is pushing uh, the state of the art in quantum information science. And <clears throat> we're starting to um, get into things like quantum tomography, where we can look at how um, <clears throat> information <clears throat> moves across um, ensembles of particles, like a mesoscopic scale. Um, but entanglement has been observed on a macroscopic scale uh, between two diamonds or cesium gases. Um, <clears throat> you know, something is going on in the quantum foam. And, uh, and, and there's even like uh, correlation waves, uh, entanglement waves moving through matter faster than light. So, <clears throat> you know, um, if, if I think, you know, this could be a very uh, productive field study um, uh, for vacuum engineering or um, even uh, consciousness studies, but I'm just wondering, have you run across anything along these lines? Like what's out there, any kind of interesting work going on in that space? Um, hmm. You know, there was uh, just a paper published just a couple of days ago by James Quash from Australia on the subject of superabsorbance and how a quantum collective effect can increase the amount of energy um, absorbed or able to put into a system. So you could potentially make a much more uh, dense battery using this approach. So that is just one thing on the top of my mind that uh, uh, just came out a couple of days ago. James Quash, I, it's, it's a Q-U-A-C-H. Uh, okay. Some That's energy. the kind of thing that, Evan, uh, you might make a note of. Uh, find that paper and pop it in the chat if that's the kind yeah, of thing yeah. that, uh, that and, you might do. Yeah, and Andre, I want to say thank you for the, the link to nitricity. Uh, we're aware of their, their work on the fertilizer. They just received $5 million of seed funding. Uh, our approach is a little different than theirs. Um, they have some catalysts uh, that they need. Um, but uh, yeah, so it kind of tells us that there is a pretty strong market for this kind of thing. Uh, so it's, uh, to me, it's very exciting that there's some other people working on that. So thank you for that. And uh, Ed, I see you have another uh, link to some, to- um, Thank you. Excuse me. New projects. For, well, this is the space that uh, my day job, if you will, um, is uh, uh, entertainment technology. Um, and, you know, specifically, I'm working uh, to open minds and open hearts. <laughs> and uh, so we uh, make and distribute uh, 360 content on VR, but mostly domes. Uh, and there's 1,700 of these digital domes in the world. So, you know, 100 million kids a year are coming through these theaters, which are now immersive visualization environments, right? So you can take them into alternate realities, other worlds, uh, potential futures. And, um, you know, so you mentioned, um, you know, putting the A in steam. So I, that's why I threw that in there. All right, great. Thank you. Have you ever run yeah. any of Carter Emmert's Digital Universe? Uh, link oh, Carter's a, yeah. you know Carter's Carter? a dear, friend, uh, dear friend from way back. In fact, they made me a job offer in uh, uh -huh. 98 to come uh, be the chief engineer there. And I turned Neil down. But you know, I... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, but I was too busy working on the Library of Alexandria. That was a fun one. Uh, but, Just sounded um, like something you might know about, and you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's part but of I, the data. He's a, 
a data visualization director for the Hayden Planetarium. He runs the, the dome there and he has an absolutely free digital universe software link that anyone can connect with and, and, and fly the dome and, and synthesize the data. And very few people take advantage of it. So that's one thing to take note of Hayden Planetarium, digital universe, all the rest of you who might be yeah. interested. Yeah, Carter M. R., the uh, director of astro visualization astro at the World Center of Earth and Space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Hey, I've got to run. I'll, I'll skip it in and out. My schedule is pretty yes, busy. Great. But, uh, yeah, thank I you. I love Thanks. your intro. I love what you guys are doing, and I support you 100%. Thank yeah. you. Stay in touch. Yeah, stay in touch. Stay and uh, Yeah. And things will be posted to our website, yeah, um, you know, the talks and the, talks, uh, yeah. and the presentation as well. Yeah. And uh, Florian left a comment. Yeah. Uh, you can read it. Yeah. Just a thought to share uh, regarding comments on words. If language is unable to transfer the ideas of the brain, perhaps brain interfaces um, could potentially be interconnected, and the brain would learn how to communicate directly uh -huh. from one brain to another. Think of a zoom of brains. Yeah. Uh, Conversations would go quicker. That is exactly though what we're right. trying to build with think, our AI model. And I think Victoria may cover that <laughs> during her talk on the octopus yeah. brain. And maybe you don't even need, you can just do it through yeah. Yeah. Uh, the interaction once you of learn the, the drill. between us. Yeah. And so hopefully Victoria will show that uh, uh, later. And I still want to talk about this. Right, right. So, okay. So thank you for the discussion. And I think. Uh, we're going to move on to the uh, next talk, which is Kate talking about the National Service Program, mm -hmm. and um, which will you know, be brief. Which will be brief, which and I, brief. you know, hi to the people that I haven't been able to say hi to yet, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis and uh, my friend Eric Inig and um, Jim and Victoria, uh, Sam September. Hi, Sam. Nice, so nice to see you. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm missing some folks as well, but mm -hmm. uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah. I'd like to just, if you could pull up the PowerPoint that just has three slides. I, I, uh, I only want to show three. Okay. And hopefully I don't kill things. Here. Yeah, don't do don't anything. Don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh -huh. So um, uh, I have to share though. I'm not sure, Jeff. Okay. Um. <laughs> Perfect, and don't worry about anything. You can just, although, I, can you guys see the whole image or is our chat window ahead of it? You can see the whole page? Yes, okay, perfect. So when we talk about mathematical beadwork, I just wanna show you, these are the materials I'm using to study energetic surfaces, planes and skins. And this right here is, I'll just hold this up so that you can kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. This is technically a hyperbolic paraboloid, but because of the materials it's made in, beads and thread, it has a lot of swimmy potential to assume a variety of shapes and forms. And a collection of- And it's a battery. And it's a battery. We have lots more to say about it. Okay. And a collection of them folds into a kind of fabric that Metamaterials has just discovered. Ours is quite pliable. And I'm just gonna show you a few slides about it. But this is the scale. It's small, it's human scale, and this is why I'm using it. This is a unit-based study of surfaces and energetic forms. And so on the first page, I just wanna share with you one of the neat things we found about energy uh, and this came through our hands, through these hands-on unit-based studies, is that anything that expresses as a flat shape in this geometry, which is the geometry of the world around us, also has a stable energetic spiral form. As Charles and I were mentioning before, we may think of ourselves as making a straight line through time, but because of time and the nature of space-time, everything has a chorality. And in fact, we're sort of spiraling along as we go directionally. And these energetic spirals do the same thing. They're worked by hand, and so they have the chorality of the stitch work. But what I really want to say to you is that whether it's the flat shape, the stack of flat shapes, or the tumbling bellflowers, each one of these represents the exact same architecture, 
made with the exact same units. They're all the same piece. It, the flat is just a snapshot in the way that a particle can be said to be a snapshot and the wave to be the thing over time. This is the snapshot and the spiraling form is an endless repetition of that, yet as it falls into the stacks, it also represents the intervals that we have. Time neatly separates our, our interactions and our days into intervals. And yet in reality, it's just a long stream of the same. These are three different ways to visualize the same kind of data. And whether I think of my data in a frequency, in a ribbon, in a curling stack, or in a flat stack of stars, it's all exactly the same thing. And so the geometric configuration of my data is going to determine how I perceive and interact with it. And so I just think this is a really interesting thing. And in this geometry of these particular units, there are only a finite number of these beautiful flat shapes. And I think that what this says to me is that this is an energetic signature. When I find these stable flat shapes, they will make a stable spiral in the same configuration. And other more chaotic, less regular or less flat shapes will make chaotic, unregular spirals. And so this is an image of coherence carrying forward through the intervals. And this is a rare thing. Um, we know it when we see it. And I think I found a signature for it hey, in my geometry, which is a flat uh, shape. Uh, hmm? is this my conference? Interesting what? thing, I was invited. The interesting thing is they're up on the screen right now. Oh, I think uh, someone is just not muted. Oh, okay, someone's just not muted. Um, and then the next slide I want to show you here is the topological egg box, like I was talking about, this guy right here. These are just some different pictures of a single warp square, which is difficult to photograph, and then different ways that the egg boxes can fold. And these hyperbolic paraboloids, when joined into a surface, make an incredible energetic folding thing, yes, but imagine if this were your skin, and each skin cell was a hyperbolic paraboloid. The shapes you could make, the folds you could do, if each unit could change color, frequency, if we sew with conductive thread, not only can we charge this thing, but let me tell you, a professor we met in North Carolina named Warren Jasper actually did weave a fabric, not of beads, just of thread, even more impressive. And one of the threads was a conductive wire thread. And with that fabric, he was able to charge it and raise a plasma on the surface. So, I mean, this is really neat. So a fabric, just a flat fabric woven with conductive thread, they can hold a plasma on the surface. The neat thing about this was that we bumped into Warren and his, his technology right off of a knitting machine uh, right when the pandemic was ramping up in early 2020, late 2019. And we immediately saw that this incredible fabric that could raise and hold a plasma could disable virus. And yet, we took it to the Navy, we took it around and we showed this idea of how perhaps lining vents, air vents, conference rooms with, we need to find the noise, with, uh, with plasma would effectively disable the virus and allow us to have safe spaces. But because of the difficulties of technology, it's not really possible to come up with a great idea in the middle of an emergency, hand it to the Navy and expect them to be able to get it onto the ships. And so we, we have the longstanding problem that in an emergency, in an urgent situation, we have the same problem we ever did. Even if we have the solution, it's difficult to deliver it to those who need it when they need it. And... <laughs> <laughs> what I really want to say about that is over these 35 years that I've been working in science, I hear the same conversations over and over again. We're all talking about the work that we want to do, that we long to do, and we all talk about the funding that we cannot get and maintain. We get little bowls of the funding here and there. It lasts a year, two years, three years, and then once again, we have a gap or 
we have a great idea, but we can't get that idea funded. You need to. I'm can trying. I ask whoever's unmuted or Evan or Charles to find, I'm trying to find the this. noise and mute the yes, person? Yes, I have been doing that. Yeah, we need to actually find it. So the idea that all of us are want to help, we are professionals in our field. Many of us are already funded by the government through various organizations, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, DARPA, NSF, to do this work, yet very few of us have any security at all or assurance that our work will be able to carry forward or be built. And this is the ongoing conversation that's been going on since people have been making work. And um, there's nothing that we're gonna be able to do to change the situation in time to make a difference. Even if we had built this ventilation system in our basement and brought it to the Navy, there's nothing they could have done to get it on the ships in time. And um, as I mentioned before, I hark back to things that have worked for the United States uh, and other countries. It's getting people together to do the work. So the way we got to the moon was by uh, dumping a huge sum of money on it and putting our best people on it, allowing them to work together to get the job done. And the Manhattan Project was another example where we actually brought people to live together. And they did incredible things. We should do something like that for peace. We should do things like that to advance our society, to advance our science. We hear all of the leaders of uh, the military. We hear our Congressional Armed Services Committee, um, our PMs, all calling for a better innovation practice, right? Calling also for national service. And yet I don't hear those people calling for national service at our level. Normally when this is discussed, it's usually for young people fledging. Well, uh, we want to make a difference. We would like to uh, get together and offer ourselves as a national service team. And this is the thing that we were working on assiduously when we thought we were seeing an end to the pandemic. We're still in a situation where we cannot gather, but we're going to continue to work this idea. And those of you who are interested in this, to imagine if you could have five years of the same funding you have now, or, even that guaranteed would make a huge difference for some of us right? with with, with um, intellectual freedom, intellectual freedom. Yeah. Right. To pursue yeah. those things, you know, not not pursue what the MURI, the multi-university research initiative call says Your heart. not to pursue what the SBIR call says you yeah. need to work on, which are all great things to do. Yeah. But I think it, it takes away from the potential of a breakthrough. Yeah that people are not thinking about because yeah. if it's a breakthrough it's something not going to be scripted it's not scripted yeah it's not something that's yeah. already been identified yeah. and you feel we're on the brink we all feel this way that we're really close to something good and and you know how it is every time we do have a breakthrough we have a fantastic idea we say the same thing it was right in front of us the whole time it was right there in front of us, wasn't it? I mean, come on, every discovery every breakthrough I've ever had, I suddenly see how to put together my parts or to sort my information or I reorganize my questions and I come up with an answer. And so this kind of reorganization is something that we really need to do. And when we're responding to scripted announcements, Mary's proposals, or when we're constantly having to rephrase what we're doing to try to match what is asked for, uh, that's not the way. Yeah. And at our age, we should be doing the work of our the work of our it's heart. It's the age of reason. Age right? of reason, work right. of the heart. Yeah. Right. And you know, studies have shown that professors spend, I think it's three quarters of their time mm -hmm. either uh, doing uh, writing proposals, yeah. uh, doing bureaucracy, or um, um, reports, reports, and right? faculty meetings and, and community obligations and all of these things are important. But I would say that for the group of people that already are at a senior level, have their own programs, are trusted performers for the government and already have government funding. Yeah, and they have their own go. Yeah, they have their own go. They have their own teams. They, they have their own lab. That sort of motivation. Yeah. So there are many of us like this. And all we wish to do is serve and not serve an not it's not even about a government it's about moving the ideas forward for the betterment of humanity and we have a lot of urgencies right now 
our help is badly needed. It's just that, and we're willing to give it. It's just that there's no current format to allow us to do so. We had proposed to the Navy when Admiral Hahn gave us our three-year Navy grant, which is coming to a close soon, that the Navy had the capacity to form what's called a commander's action working group. And in that, a person might have a little more freedom to put together a group of already funded people allow them the freedom to work together and just get things done. Um, the Navy, just like the rest of the government, is drowning in bureaucracy. And um, yeah, so most the, of the, the, you know, the Admiral is two years out in his budget. Yeah, Admiral Selby, uh, who took over as the CNR, a commander of Navy research for Admiral Hahn, he was shocked when he found out that he couldn't affect the budget because the the POM, the Program Authorization Memorandum, goes is two years in the future. Two years. And so by the time <laughs> the budget he can affect, he's gone because that's their stint is about two years in that And this role. is very common. And DARPA yeah. program managers come and go. And we all want to help, and, but and yeah, short DARPA, bites yeah, don't do it. Yeah, DARPA yeah. is an exception, right? Yeah. That's one reason they've been so successful mm -hmm. is that they have much more flexibility in their budgets. But they still are, I am sure, hampered by the same sort of thing. There always are rules and parameters. And yeah. even if DARPA could feel the team that didn't have those. So I sketched, I, you know, I sketched out a little program because that's, you know, that's kind of what I do, mm -hmm. I guess. But for 85 million a year, you could have 20 top PIs, mm -hmm. each with a 10 person team and a nice budget for equipment. It wouldn't be a Murray thing. It'd be this other more Manhattan project like moonshot like thing that would be going after breakthroughs with the intellectual freedom to pursue those things and, and um, the five year commitment and with the commitment the persistence yeah. of vision is what i like saying you know yeah. you got to have that persistence mm -hmm. um and you know and so that's that's a drop in the bucket compared to yeah. what what um you know pe people spend on you things. can take that away too also uh you know i think that we need to answer the repeated calls from people like uh seth moulton and mike walsh from the armed services committee uh, i i watched them speaking to the heads of naval research and others and they're basically demanding a national service program and better innovation progress and i think we should call them on that and again for a fairly modest budget congress could field an experiment where perhaps the individual branches of the military uh, or DARPA cannot. And so this is what I want to say. We're continuing to pursue this. In a pandemic, everything is difficult, but we will not give up. We all know, because we've all been saying it forever, what's holding us back. We know what we could do if we only were allowed to properly serve. And so all we can do is keep reiterating the request to do that. And in the meantime, we're gonna work on the things that we feel can make a difference. Charles has chosen Flow, the fertilizer, as one of the things to put his soul behind because it could solve so many problems at once. So it could even take away a weapon. You know, those big trucks full of fertilizer are dangerous and they don't need to be driving around the world. Farmers don't need to be buying sterilized seeds and paying for fertilizer. A change like this could be really material. And um, I've chosen to work on the QI data program with the hopes of getting this actually funded by DARPA. I know Dr. Lewis is interested in doing it. We're all interested in doing it. And so we're just going to go ahead and start. And you may see Evan McKinnon on this chat. We have actually hired uh, Evan with a master's degree in AI to help us begin building. And so we're not going to wait. We're just going to get started and we're going to try to load up a database with everything we know, everything we hope to know, and then incorporate some of the tools from OpenAI and others, um, chatbots, organization tools, uh, to get this thing to talk to us. Yeah. And we're just going to make a start and um, communicate with it to the greatest extent we can. I'm going to teach mine to bead so I can help it understand why I'm doing these unit-based studies in a way that will allow it to be curious about its own unit-based studies yeah. and see I, where it goes. I don't know if anyone has played around with GPT-3, the, you know, the open AI uh, language bot, but sometimes it says things that are super, sometimes it says lame things, but sometimes it says things that are really clever and um, really makes you think. So it's 
that's the way I, I picture this AI team member is it would come up with things, but then it needs direction from, mm -hmm. from humans. It can't yeah. work on its own. No, there'd be a lot of back and forth, but that's part of the joy <laughs> of it. And, you know, one of the reasons that people don't train their own AI is because it's very expensive. People use a lot of these modules, these plug and play modules to sort of load AI uh, with all of the information of humankind. And there's a lot of garbage in there. Uh, we just really want to start from scratch as if we were raising a child um, um, or clone ourselves in a way and uh, so i just wanted to mention that these are the things we're putting our heart behind while we're busy bothering congress to call them on their repeated requests for a national service program to do innovation we're all right here ready and uh, you'll certainly be hearing from us uh, if and when we have any success in this and any of these endeavors right right any of these endeavors and yes, so we're not going to stop are we no no